Hello. Um, so I'm Laurie. Uh, most people know me as Laurie Shepard. I did get married, so if you, I'm also Laurie Kern, so I could go by either. Um, I've been part of the Bioconductor Core team for several years now, and as mentioned, I'm going to talk about the Annotation Hub and Experiment Hub, some key infrastructure pieces available for use um, to the community. So uh, throughout the presentation, I hope to cover what the Annotation Hub and Experiment Hub are, how you would find resources as a user to use, um, and then some common misconceptions regarding the hubs, and then get more into from the maintainer and package developer side, how you would contribute or add data to the hubs, and then common pitfalls when you're submitting data. So just a poll here, because I like to be a little, little interactive. There's not a lot of it, but um, for those of you in the audience here, sorry, I can't get to you virtual people, but um, how many of you have used the hubs before? Just... Okay, good. Um, so what do you think the hubs are? Just in a general concept. So in the heart data, um, the annotation hub and experiment hub is basically a database of pointers or a database of basically um, resources and metadata about different resources. Um, most importantly, where the data can be downloaded from. So it's kind of like just a database of information that you can use and query to find resources of interest for you to use in your packages or using your resources or in your research. Um, Okay, um, <clears throat> so when you use the annotation hub and experiment hub, you load the library and you call the constructors and you're gonna get a hub object. And that hub object has an SQLite database in the back end that has all this metadata about particular resources. And the metadata is given by a contributor at the time of inclusion into the database that then you can query against. And most importantly, again, is where you can download the data from. So files are stored remotely instead of in a package or somewhere, and then they're only downloaded as, need a, as needed or as requested. Um, if a contributor doesn't have a location to store that data, Bioconductor provides a default location, currently the Microsoft Azure Data Lake resource, um, but they can be stored elsewhere on institutional servers, Zenodo, a publicly accessible server. So they're stored remotely and then downloaded as needed and then they're cached locally. So there's an expensive download once and then if you try to call that resource again on your local machine, it'll be really fast because it'll find that locally downloaded resource. So the main functions that you're going to use to find resources are query and subset. Most people will find query uh, the most useful and the recommended. The subset is kind of more of an exact search and is a priori knowledge. And again, this is all against the metadata in the database. So what kind of metadata are we talking about? So when a uh, resource is submitted, we get information that must be provided and these are the required fields. So a title, uh, data class, species, taxonomy ID, uh, preparer class, which in general, uh, it's a little mis uh, misgiving, but the preparer class is the package name. So when um, a person submits data, you have to have a package to submit data, so it would be like the package name and other useful uh, information that we'll get into in a little bit. So kind of as an example, code example here, uh, sorry it's not interactive, but um, we'll use Annotation Hub to start. So we load Annotation Hub, we create the Annotation Hub object, and I created this slide as of July 6th. So as of July 6th, we had 65,000 55 records in the annotation hub that could be queried and found and used in data. Um, and it kind of gives you a, snap a snapshot here of different metadata fields and what is available. So again, to reemphasize that, different columns in the database and in that object, you can query against the title, you can query against maintainer, source type. Um, so for instance, if we had species, if we looked at unique species, we have 
2,557 unique species available in some form of data in the annotation hub. And we can just kind of get a snapshot of the different species. And then similarly, there's the R data class. So our data class in uh, this instance is what type of object when you load or read that remote file into R, what kind of file are you gonna to get to work with or what kind of object are you gonna to get to work with? So are you gonna get a two bit file? Are you gonna get a G range object? Are you gonna get a summarized experiment object? So you can also kind of query for objects that you're used to using or familiar with using. So as a further example of query, sorry, all you cat people, I'm a dog person. So we're gonna use dog and uh, my Latin is not good. So I'm not gonna to try to pronounce it. But uh, so if we just did a query against the hub for dog, we would get back another hub record kind of paring down. But you see, we still have 223 records here. So still kind of a lot. So maybe we like G-range objects. So if we did a query then with dog and G-range objects, get a little bit better. We're down to 125. So you can kind of see where we're going. The more specific you can get, um, you kind of get more specialized results. So if any of you were in um, James McDonald's annotation uh, workshop, I think he kind of equates it to like a Google search, right? It's kind of hit or miss. You might have to massage the query a little bit to kind of find what you want, but you can kind of pare it down and try to get objects of interest. Once you kind of have it in a more pared down list, you can really dig into the metadata columns. So with a single, uh, sub a uh, single bracket with a given uh, annotation hub ID, you can get that metadata column and get more specific information on a particular resource to know if you really want to download it or not. To download the resource, then you use a double um, bracket and then you would actually download the resource locally and it would be cached. And kind of as a proof of principle, if we did it again, this is like my R code. So the first time we're downloading, we get the long download. It might take a minute or two, depending on how the, the file size. And then it loads it in R and we have our G range object. But then if we tried the double square bracket again to download, it would skip that download step and just directly load it from your local cache. So kind of a time saver. Um, <clears throat> just kind of continuing on, because I came from the annotation workshop, um, maybe in the end, we like G range objects, but we were really looking for a text DB object. We take that G range object that we had just uh, loaded in R, we can load our genomic features and there's this make TXDB from G range function and we can get our TXDB object. Proof of principle, we probably could have just queried for a TXDB instead of G ranges. And if we did that, we can see that we actually had a lot more options and some more recent builds. So again, kind of proving the point of you might want to play around with your queries and uh, there may be some ways to get different um, objects depending on how well you form your queries. Um, don't know why I went backwards. Okay. Uh, Experiment Hub works the same way. Um, main distinctions, annotation is for annotation data, some sort of mapping from one uh, source to another, where annotate, or Experiment Hub is for experiment data, experiment packages. Um, right now, Bioconductor doesn't allow large data inside a package for submission. So we'll say if you wanted to include experiment data with your package for proof of principle or more detailed vignette, we would ask you to put it in an experiment hub and then uh, download it from there, which we'll get into in a little bit too. But experiment hub works the exact same way, same constructor, uh, again, same date as July 6th, but this time we have 6,332 records in the experiment hub. And again, we can perform queries the exact same way, kind of pare down. Um, again, I talked about this preparer class, so especially with Experiment Hub, maybe you know the package that had the data in it. You could actually search for the package name to get all of the data that was given with a particular package of interest. Um, and just as a different proof principle with different metadata, we could search for the genome and see what, uh, what particular genomes those objects came back at. Um, I did mention subset, so as a subset example, subset is an exact match, so again, requires a priori knowledge. So with subset, you're giving the hub object and you're giving an exact match of a particular metadata column. 
So again, that's why most people find query a little bit more useful, especially if you don't exactly know what you're looking for. Um, I guess before we get into misconceptions and everything, is there any questions about like using binding data? Do we have any questions so far? size limit? Um, not right now. We haven't defined an exact limit. I would say if your data is extremely large, reach out on the BioC mailing list. We generally ask like to reach out there if there would be some sort of um, size limit, but right now we haven't limited sizes. Yep. This one? Um, so query will search all fields. I, there is, I think, an additional argument where you could like limit what columns it searches for, um, but otherwise it'll do it across all columns by default. So you kind of get a, a more broad search to try to catch all fields of interest. And it would be um, believe in and search. So instead of an or. Um, it could be, and we can kind of get into that when people are submitting data. Um, the real limiting factor would be like getting it into R or loading R, but there's no reason why it couldn't be images. And um, whoever submits those, we would probably recommend using the generic file path um, load method, which we'll get into in the second half. Possibly, yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, any more questions? So common misconceptions before we get into contributing data um, that the bioconductor provides all of these resources is actually um, very um, not true. Actually, we rely on the community to provide resources to us. So Bioconductor will provide by default a few annotations at release time and when there's new ensemble releases. But other than that, everything that's in the hub is user contributed. So we really rely on the community to help each other to um, contribute and be able to distribute resources of interest to the community. Um, another one is that we update the data. So again, kind of along with that, once it's in there, we don't update it. So that's why we asked for a maintainer and why we started associating data with a package, because if people are interested in a more updated version, they could reach out to the maintainer since they had provided and curated and um, are more familiar with generating it, that they could probably provide an update and then put it in the hub again. Um, and then one, another one is that all data is hosted by Bioconductor. Again, um, you can host it on your institutional server or something like a publicly really accessible server like Zenodo. Um, the only thing that we don't ask is that it can't be like on a personal level, like a GitHub or a Dropbox. So we want it to be more public, more stable. Um, but again, if you don't have access to that resource, then we could provide our Bioconductor Microsoft data link um, that Microsoft is so graciously uh, giving us and helping us with um, to host your resources. So contributing, um, getting a little bit more into contributing rather than using hubs, since we just talked about how most of the resources are user contributed. Um, so starting with their, their package base so that we can track them so that hopefully um, to help you too, if you have a script or something that has done the curation, that has done a generation, if you wanted to regenerate or do another version, another um, subset of resources that the code is there and easily reproducible, traceable. Um, and then again, if there's a problem with the resource, hopefully someone from the community could reach out to you with questions. Um, 
we do have a helper package. The bioconductor package hub pub has been created. It um, <clears throat> takes advantage of uh, Leo's BioC this package to create a template. And then it also has a lot of helper functions that will help you create the necessary files for a hub package. And a lot of that information is also in the vignette uh, create a hub in the hub pub package. So really what makes a hub contributed package different than a normal package is very few things. Um, so all bioconductor packages require a BioC views term in the description. But if you're going to use the hubs, we ask that you put in the appropriate either experiment hub, annotation hub, experiment hub software, annotation hub software um, keyword so that we can track it as a hub package. And then instead of the data being directly in your package, since um, I briefly mentioned, but we don't allow large data files, especially with Git, um, that they're not allowed in the package. So we would encourage you to use and distribute through the experiment hub. So those data would not be in the package itself. We would instead in the inst directory in the X data have a metadata file. So kind of the fields that we just talked about, the titles, the descriptions, the information about the resource that's provided in a metadata CSV file that then could be um, inputted into the database so it would be there and queryable. Additionally, then we would have an inscript folder that gives information on how the resources were generated, kind of like a how-to. So if a user did want to recreate your data objects, they would be able to. And it could be code, pseudocode, text, just some sort of indication. Most importantly, if there's any sort of source information or licensing that should be aware of for the resources that it would be included there. Um, everything else is the same as a normal package submission and you would submit it to the new package submission tracker for review and go on as normal. Um, again, the metadata file is the biggest thing. So I just kind of wanted to take a little bit of time and break down the different metadata fields um, really briefly, since that's the main difference and the important part, because that's what people will be querying against in the database. So the required columns of the metadata file are a title, so the name of your resource. Um, in Experiment Hub, there is the option to create these accessor functions for a specific resource. So if you titled it Lori V2, um, once you use this accessor function, you could actually have a function in the package that automatically gets created. So it's the same as the title. So if a user calls that with a parentheses, it would automatically load an R. So if you use that, we do tell you to try to avoid spaces and punctuations for obvious reasons. So it can convert into that um, nice function name that a, the user could call. Description, again, kind of like an abstract for your resource, a little bit more thorough description of what the resource is. Um, we ask to avoid special characters, just since it's going into an SQLite database, it doesn't always like special characters, so we ask you to try to avoid them, if at all possible. Um, and then the BioC version. So the BioC version should be the bioconductor version that the resource will be first available. So most often than not, it's gonna be the current develop version of Bioconductor where that version is going in. So it would be the current Bioconductor devel version. So if you submitted one before the next release, probably 316 right now. Um, we do ask for genome, species, taxonomy ID, and coordinate one base system. We realize these are more geared towards like annotation data, but we do ask for it for experiment data resources too. So they all can be NA if it's not appropriate for the data. Um, we do have some helper functions too to make sure that it's kind of consistent as far as capitalization and punctuation since R is case sensitive. So um, we have helper functions like get species list and valid species to help kind of make it consistent. Um, and we do have a validation function for the taxonomy ID based on a given species with that matches against the genome info DB load taxonomy DB. So um, you can always look at that for validation. Um, and then coordinate one based just for annotation based to know if you're zero or one based since um, some platforms index differently. It's important to know for annotation purposes. Um, the next three kind of deal with the original source of the data. So source type, so the format of the original data, 
and we do have a helper function for get valid source types. Um, if you don't find a valid source type that you think is appropriate for your data, you can always request it to be added through the BioC Devel mailing list or the hubs at bioconductor.org email. And if your data is truly simulated, we ask, we do have a type of simulated that is an acceptable type that we would ask you to put. Um, source URL would be the original location of the data files. Sometimes it's a combined um, multiple sources. If you have multiple sources, we ask that it's a single string separated by a, a comma. And again, if the data is simulated, we recommend either then putting your lab as a source URL or um, the anticipated bioconductor package short link would also be a good or acceptable option as well there then. Um, source version. Obviously, versions change. So if there's a given source version or date of um, data, we would recommend putting that there. And data provider. So uh, where did the data come from? Is it CFC, Ensemble, um, your lab? Some indication of where it came from. Um, I kind of briefly mentioned it. So the R data class would be the type of object that you get back to work with in R. So am I getting back a G-range object, a summarized experiment object, a range summarized experiment object, a single cell object? So people kind of get an idea of what they would be expected to work with um, or can transition to. Um, and dispatch class. So this can be a little tricky for submitters and um, this could be uh, where we get into like reading and loading. So a dispatch class determines how uh, annotation hub or experiment hub will load the remote file after it's downloaded. So it will use some predefined dispatch classes to automatically load a file into R for immediate use. So examples, if you use like the generic save, the dispatch class would be RDA so that it would use that load method. If it's created with save RDS, you would use RDS so it knows to use the read RDS. Is it read RDS, load RDS? Blanking at the moment, but um, kind of get the idea there. And there are a number of available ones and Annotation Hub has a helper class of dispatch class list. And when in doubt, if you don't know what to use, we recommend the file path, which is kind of a catch-all. So this is where it would download and then instead of trying to load it back into R for you, it will give you the local path where it cached it on your system. So then you can use that path in whatever appropriate load or read method. So if you had even some specialized read method because it was some object or a specialized object that you were using or creating something new, that way you could load it in yourself. Um, and then probably the most important columns are this location prefix column and the R data path column. Um, so these are the two that will define where that remote file is and sh should be downloaded from. So for location prefix, if you're using the bioconductor default location, you would actually skip this column because we'll populate it for you. Um, but if you're um, using your own server, it would be the base URL to that server. And then should have the trailing slash. And then the R data path would be the remainder of the resource. So when you're using a default bioconductor one, we ask you to upload it in a directory, the same name as the package. And then you could have any number of subdirectories underneath it, but it would be the name of the package and then your file or the name of the package and subdirectory and file that includes the resource name and the extension. So you can kind of think of these two as if you took the location prefix and the R data path and concatenated them together, it should be the complete URL of that downloaded resource. Like if you clicked on it, you would start the automatic download in your web browser type thing. It should be that complete download URL. Um, and again, I know this can, and we've gotten a lot of questions on it in the past. So just to kind of emphasize a couple different examples here. So if you wanted to upload a directory um, and you're uploading your package and you're using the bioconductor default storage location and you have a subdirectory, um, subdirectory one and subdirectory two, and each of those directories has two files. And we'll say, well, one of the files has a CSV and extension and one of them has an RDA extension. So it 
your metadata would have something like this, where there would not be a location prefix column, but you would have an R data path column, and it would be your package name, subdirectory one with file one.cvs, and your package name, subdirectory one, file two.rda, et cetera. For a second example, say you're hosting it on some institutional level server, and let's say you had two files and your paths look something like this to complete path download. It might look something like the following, where your location prefix then becomes the base URL to the path, and then your R data path would be the completion of it. So you see that we have their my institutional website and data server with the trailing slash, and then the R data becomes the rest of the URL path. Um, in truth, data server could probably be included in the R data path. I guess it kind of, this is a little discretion as you're contributing. So um, I would say the base path should be the limited path. So if eventually you would submit other data sets, I would say use the smallest path that would be repeatable is like the location prefix path because then that stays consistent even if you're adding more data and then the unique part would be in your our data path section if that makes any sense um last two fields in the metadata column that are required is the maintainer so again we ask to check so that if there's an issue with a resource if someone reports an issue with a resource they can either contact us and we can contact you or they could contact you directly and is a name and an email address and then tags so um, tags could be anything that you think relevant to the resource and additional that people could query against um, if you're using multiple tags, we ask that it be a single string and then separated by a colon. And we do grab any um, unique BIOC views or specialized BIOC views and automatically put them in as tags. So like every resource isn't going to have the annotation hub that we just asked you to put in as a BIOC views tag. But um, if you look into the BIOC views, it can get more specific to single cell type data or um, a specific platform. So you can put those in your BIOC views and they'll be automatically applied to all the resources um, where this could be a little bit more specialized per resource as far as tagging a resource for querying. Um, you can include any other sort of columns in your metadata column um, or in your metadata file. They'll just be ignored by us and won't be included in the database. But if you wanted to include additional columns for your own purposes, or if you're going to use that file in your R code in some other way, you can include as many as you'd like. We just won't use them and we'll ignore them. Um, any questions thus far? So there's a question in the chat um, from Mandy Griswold. Is there an upside to uploading data to the hub rather than hosting data on a separate server and then accessing it through um, biofile cache, bioc file cache? Um, I would say probably the visibility and um, getting it more exposed because then you have it in a multitude of ways because like bioc file cache is its own semi-contained self and it would be only discoverable through your package where Experiment Hub and Annotation Hub didn't put it in this presentation too, but there's also um, Shiny versions and web app versions so people could find your data then and possibly use it in different ways that um, you didn't even think possible or collaborative research wise that it could be exposed and distributed um, in other ways. Any other questions? So, so thinking of just sort of places where people dump data, um, I don't know whether it's Zendo or Dataverse or something like that, is there any of them that make it better? Or is there any that you'd say, oh, this is a one where we've had problems or this is a one that you'd definitely recommend that works really well? I would say not offhand. I would say I pointed out it as a main misconception because most people think they have to and normally just upload to Bioconductor um, where we've had people being like, oh, well, I have it on this server. Can you upload it for us here? And we're like, you can keep it there. It's okay. Um, 
So we haven't run into those sort of issues. Um, I would say when in doubt, you could always shoot the um, BioC mailing list a question or the hubs at bioconductor.org a question. And I guess I would put it back out to the community to let us know if they're experiencing or if they've experienced any slow download times, I guess, to let us know because then we could be aware of it to tell people to avoid hosting it there. Um, but we haven't seen any large drawbacks from any of the ones that have currently been used outside of us. Um, I would say using the bioconductor default one kind of guarantees it to work and you know that we're probably going to secure it and keep it um, around, I guess is one of the plus sides because we we like to ensure data reproducibility. So we're going to try within our power to make sure that it never goes away. So. Uh, I have a question. What kind of um, data objects uh, do you typically find are the most commonly uploaded and that you can download directly? The cell experiments in your example. I would say probably the recent pushes, summarized experiments and single cell experiments, just because they're um, kind of the, the hot thing and um, the most widely used right now. Awesome. Um, I would say in Annotation Hub 2, um, every ensemble release, there's um, Johannes Strainer's uh, ENSDB. He provides uh, our. Uh, I can't remember exactly what type of object, but every ensemble release, there's Johannes's versions of them. And we also include um, two bits and uh, G range versions of all the ensemble releases that they provide. So that would be another big one that's um, popular in Annotation Hub, at least. Awesome. Uh, any other questions for this? Um, so I did harp on the metadata file. So just about the file itself, because that was all about like the contents of the metadata file. Um, so it should be in the inst X data directory of a package, and it should have an accompanied in script file that describes how those resources were um, generated. Again, it could be code, pseudocode, text. We just kind of want like a little bit of a how to of how it was generated. So if people wanted to, they could produce an object of the same, or at least know how it was um, formed. And most importantly, if there's any sort of source information and licensing information that should be included there. So we know that it could be distributed and that it's um, you know appropriate to include in the hubs. Um, it has to be the CSV file with all the required columns that we just went over in detail. Um, and we've been referring, well, I've been referring to it as metadata.csv, but it can be called anything you want as long as it's a CSV file. So it could be resources.csv, it could be subset data1.csv, as long as it's a CSV file. And uh, there can be more than one. So uh, a lot of data submitters that do a repeat or additional data will often include it as a separate metadata file so that they know when or have some sort of distinction of versions and that is totally acceptable when you submit it or request additional data to be added just let us know what the name of that file is but it can be called anything and you can have multiple versions if it's easier for you to maintain um Based on those differences, then as far as the submission process, basically you would recreate your template package with the needed BioC views and that metadata file, and you would shoot off an email to hubs at bioconductor.org. Um, don't know where I, I really put maintainer at bioconductor.org. The main one is hubs at bioconductor.org. Um, and uh, give us the link to the uh, package so that we know where to find it. And if you're using the bioconductor storage, you will request access because we have to give you uh, specialized keys in order to upload the data. And we would give you a temporary access code so that you could upload the data to a staging site that we would move over into the location. Um, 
And then once that's available, we would let you know that's available in the database. And then you could alter your package then to use the hub interfaces to download the data in your package or to make people aware and finish off your package documentation. And then you would submit it to the new submission tracker, just like a regular package. So fairly straightforward as far as submitting. Um, there could be a little bit of back and forth with getting the data into the database. And that's, oh, okay. Um, I guess before I go into that, um, there's the hub pub package. I mentioned it before, um, Kayla from the core team has kind of developed it and um, utilizes some of Leo's BioC this to create a template package and then has a lot of helper functions to help add the data to the metadata file, try to get it in the right format and has a lot of validation so that hopefully it can be more straightforward and less hiccups when submitting the data to us to get it into the database. Um, she has a great package vignette to use those helper functions. And then the create a hub package vignette is available for converting an existing package to a hub package if there's um, an existing package that you wanted to transition over or creating a hub package from scratch. Uh, Here's what it's getting at. Some common pitfalls and just some of the things that sometimes we go back and forth on with getting the data into the database. Um, R is case sensitive. Um, if you didn't know it's case sensitive, it is. So it does make a difference, especially at that download location. Um, if it doesn't match and doesn't match exactly with case, there would be download issues. Um, and Going along with that, um, just general typos, be careful that what you upload to your server is the actual location path in your metadata file. We get a lot of just random typos. Um, some of the other things is that like the number of uploads should match the metadata. We normally give you permission, especially if you're on a bioconductor server, to check uh, the downloads versus the uploads. In general, they should match. I, I say in general because there are exceptions because there are specialized cases with like annotations that you can upload, like the BAM and the BAM index file where they're dissociated together. So then your uploads aren't going to match because that would be uh, associated with, with one. But in general, your upload should match the number of rows in your metadata column. Um, we do require that there's at least two unique tags per resource. So either with BioC views or using that tags column, there has to be two unique or, or two valid tags per resource. Um, again, I kind of mentioned it with the description of the metadata columns, but we try to avoid special characters because the database doesn't always like them. Um, we can try it, just some things that we normally go back and forth on and comes back. And um, we do have validation functions in Annotation Hub and Experiment Hub called Make Annotation Hub Metadata and Make Experiment Hub Metadata. We run these to get it into the database. So if you run it and you get an error, we're going to run it and we're going to get an error and it's not going to get in the database. So we really recommend running these before trying to send us it. And if you're getting an error or can't understand why there's an error, reach out to us because we're more than healthy happy to help figure out why or um, what we need to do to to make it valid. Um, acknowledgements. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, our grant funding for Bioconductor and the ITCR that funds all of our research with Bioconductor and specifically the hubs. Um, core team throughout the years. Um, I didn't start the hubs. It was created by other core team members and we've had many contributors. Um, with package code and contributions and recipes to get the data in that we do for default and the maintenance and the infrastructure behind it. Um, and then again, since it's user contributed, it wouldn't really be popular without you guys contributing resources to the hubs and um, using it. So all of you. Um, and if there are any more questions, that's all the slides I had. So I'd be happy to take more questions. Hi, Laurie. Um, yeah, so I feel like I have a lot of um, edge questions, I mean, edge cases or cases that can break it. Um, and um, maybe we need to talk about them more. But um, 
one of them that comes to mind is like Recon Tree, which now that it, uh, now, now, now that I know that it, the data can be hosted elsewhere, that's more than like maybe a million files. So maybe that's too much. Um, and then the other one is um, a family of questions related to uh, spatial transcriptomics, where um, about like how we're at resolution should we be uploading, um, um, and then like should we upload like the data that's easy to read into R? Should we upload also the data that is part of the raw data that then gets processed? that then can be easily read into R. Should we upload the actual R data? But like that package, for example, Spatial Experiment has had a lot of breaking changes. So like even, even within a major version of Bioconductor, like the data can become unusable um, well, because the package will change. So um, um, I don't know. I don't, okay. I don't know if you have one that you want to get more into and or other ones we could... Uh, uh, we definitely should talk because we definitely should try to um, expand it, make it more robust, make it more usable. I would say millions, probably a little bit of an overload for the current implementation of the hubs. Um, I didn't really get into the future and what we plan to revamp the hubs, but um, we did want to look at um, ways to move, because right now when you use the annotation hub and experiment hub, everyone that calls the constructor will download a copy of the database and then it gets queried locally. Uh, we want to try to revamp that over the next year to move it to a cloud hosted database and only download as necessary and um, still have some workarounds to be able to use it and download parts of it locally if necessary, but that Moving towards that seems like that would be kind of more of a solution where as long as it can get into the database and have those point references, then that would make that closer to being able to be possible. Um, as far as raw data versus process data and where to go, um, I would say we're probably not the expert with that. Probably would want to kind of get a feel from other areas and researchers in the field to know if having that raw data and working from that point, if they would have other use cases for it, that then more of the raw data should go in if it thinks it could be expanded out um, in different ways than your specific R objects. Um, if it's more specialized or specialized use case in a package or increases functionality or productivity of your individual package, then I would say maybe getting more into the process or object would probably be a better way to go. Um, but that's my own personal thought. I'm sure that other people and probably other um, technical advisory people would probably argue one way or the other. So I would say kind of more feel it out for your audience. And you would prefer to have those discussions on um, the mailing list or GitHub issues? Uh, either. Uh, might be good to have it on the mailing list because then gets more of the community involved. And since it would kind of move towards a community feel and know where people want to go with it, that would probably, I would probably encourage it there. <sighs> I'm probably going to get a lot of heat on there, but yeah. <laughs> I would say probably the mailing list because it would be good to get other people's opinions. Awesome, thank you. Uh, just to, my input to you, Leonardo, is that if your package, have it go from the raw data, If because if someone's learning how to use a package and they would have the raw data and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, we'll just upload this already processed data object that's already in the R format you need, that's not helpful for the user if that's part of your package that's not somewhere else. I think in general, we recommend as raw as possible unless there's like uh, efficiency yeah. benefits to yeah. it. Just had a quick question though for you, Lori, are these slides gonna be available somewhere and can we link them from the website? Yes, uh, I believe um, all of the conference material will eventually be up on the website somewhere. If not, I can always send you a copy, um, but almost all the conference material gets posted somewhere post. Okay. To, to the people in person, if you say your name before you answer the question, then the online people can probably participate. Um, this is from Mervyn Vansler. Um, from, from 
For annotation data, should variants be submitted as separate packages? For example, an annotation pipeline that generates different outputs depending on gen code versions. Hmm. My gut says yes. Um, again, I'm kind of not... I hate to say I'm not the expert in the field, but I would say getting a feel for what people use more often would probably be um, the more appropriate way to go. And again, asking on the mailing list what people think should be included and in getting, uh, I guess, people that would be using it more, which is more useful, would probably be my best answer. Um, It's not really a question, but more of a comment in response to Leo's question. Um, based on my experience using um, the hubs, um, and I've developed the curated TCJ data, so my advice would be to use like a data frame and then construct your class based on those basic data types, because that would allow for any new versions of um, the classes to be constructed on the fly rather than having them break if, if there is a major change to those. Any other questions? Okay. You think of any? I'm, grab me for a cup of coffee, slack me, I'm always around. <laughs> Thank you.